Welcome to Come to Your Senses, the School of Sensual Living podcast. I'm your host, Mary Lofgren. Here, we explore how to live bravely and beautifully through pleasure, mindfulness, embodiment, femininity, beauty, art, and of course, everyday sensuality. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. It's Mary. So grateful to be here with you to talk about one of my favorite things to talk about as I just say the words. I feel like there's a rose cream macaron on my tongue. Today's topic is beauty and style, and specifically moving past the overwhelm of trying to have style and into an experience of style and beauty in your everyday that feels easy and exciting and fun and pleasurable. And before we get into the juicy bits of today's podcast, I want to take a moment to offer some community gratitude. This is a relatively new podcast and we have had over 20 reviews written about the podcast, all of them five star. And so I wanted to just take a moment to express my sincere gratitude for your support and appreciation. So our review of the day comes from True Edge Lifestyle. And True Edge Lifestyle says, as always, Mary has a unique and exceptional way of teaching lessons we think we already know. She is reimagining an ever more graceful way for us to come home to ourselves. Thank you so, so much, True Edge Lifestyle, for that review. And I chose that one for today because I think it really articulates exactly what we're about to talk about which is this process of coming home to ourselves, which can often feel laborious and finding ways to make it feel graceful and beautiful, like a big juicy peach. So thank you to everyone who left a review. And if you enjoy the podcast and you'd like to leave a review, you can just head over to schoolofsensualliving.com slash review. And there is actually a 40 second video that teaches you how to do it. And let's get into today's episode. And so I want to begin today with a quote from one of my favorite books about style, which is called The Art of Dressing by Zipporah Solomon. I actually met Zipporah at a friend's engagement party many years ago. I was performing burlesque. It was a custom act I had made specifically for the bride and all of her guests, and it featured nods to her and her partner and their engagement. And Zipporah was there, and she's this incredible icon of New York fashion. She was one of the women featured in the movie Advanced Style by Ari Seth Cohen, which is an amazing movie. It's actually on the list of required viewing in our intensive coaching programs at the School of Sensual Living. But Zipporah was featured in that movie, and so I was so delighted to meet her in person. And like I said, I had just done a burlesque routine, and she said to me, Mary, I've worked in the fashion industry all my life, and I've never said these words, but you make me want to gain weight. And I was very honored, and I will never forget that compliment. And so here is a quote from her book. And in this quote, she's talking about the characteristic of originality as it relates to one of her icons, Diana Vreeland. It is precisely this characteristic, originality, that sets one apart and is the key to having style. The only way to get it is by knowing oneself. Style starts with having a sense of self, with knowing who you are, where you come from, what attracts you, what turns you on. Style doesn't just happen. It needs to be cultivated, chiseled, refined. In the next chapters, you'll meet 10 women who exemplify style. 
all are over the age of 50 because it takes about that long to master this thing called style. And I would just add a personal note here that I think it takes about that long to really know yourself, like Zipporah is describing. All have their distinct looks and unique style. What they share is a full life, an active life, a life that makes demands on them into which they give of themselves wholeheartedly. Few of these women are involved in fashion, although some are quite fashionable. All of them are stylish, and all of them are triumphantly themselves. Couldn't you just lap that up with a spoon? So what I find Zipporah is describing here is this energy that I like to call femme vital energy. And I first read that term in Betsy Prealu's book, Seductress, Women Who Ravished the World and Their Lost Art of Love. And femme vital energy, we all know femme fatale, which literally translated means deadly woman. Femme vital energy is this energy of feminine life force. As Zipporah described, a woman who truly knows herself, and in this case, chooses to express that knowing through the beauty and the art that she creates with her style. And beauty is not just a fun, comforting aesthetic. Remembering that beauty is a way in which we communicate. So beauty is how we celebrate our greatest joys. It's why we get dressed up when someone is celebrating a wedding or a birthday. Beauty is how we make sense of our sorrows. It's where all great art comes from. It's why we send flowers to a memorial. And on a primal level, if beauty were sound, style is language. So, for example, the way I communicate with my dog, Winnie, mainly is through sound. If I need her to stop doing something, it's not my words that get her to stop doing that. It's my tone and it's my sound. As human beings, we have this extraordinary imaginative ability to communicate through the refinement and the subtlety of language. And with style, you know, beauty itself is this vast ocean of resourcefulness and inspiration. And style is how we express our individuality through the language of how we look. Now, you might be a person who thinks, Mary, I love what you're saying, but I just don't have the time. Plus, at the time of this recording, we're in quarantine. Who even cares? Nobody is seeing me throughout the day. I'm not fashionable. I don't have the money to invest. And I totally hear you. In some ways, I feel like the world of style can feel really impenetrable. And I want to make a really important distinction here, which is that there are some vast differences between trying to be in fashion and trying to express your style. So I believe it was Yves Saint Laurent who said, fashion fades, style is eternal. I remember being in high school and in high school, it's a very long story, but essentially I was really obsessed with appearance as a form of social currency. You know, appearance was how I made myself matter in a time where I just had very little self-confidence, self-esteem, what Zipporah describes as knowing oneself. And fashion and clothing was an area of real fun and joy for me, but it was also a way of communicating my desperation to be liked and to fit in. I use that as an example of the difference between a relationship to fashion and beauty and style that can be exhausting and outward facing, a way of just seeking approval versus the deeply rich, sustainable, satisfying experience of style when it is an expression of your insides being visible through your outsides. And so 
what I'd like to share with you now are five essential truths that I have come to know about style in my own exploration and in studying and observing other artists of style. The first is simplicity. So one of my favorite stories about Diana Vreeland is she was being interviewed by a editor at Vanity Fair. And if you've ever seen the cover of her movie, The Eye Must Travel, or The Eye Has to Travel, she's in this very layered, very eclectic red room with all different types of wallpaper and furniture and everything's a play on red. And she's wearing a red dress and she's got these stacked bracelets and she's holding a cigarette holder. And the editor asks her, Diana, what is your secret? And she takes a drag from her cigarette. She goes, simplicity, darling, simplicity. (laughs) And what I love about that story is that you look at this image of a woman in flaming red with all different types of patterns and all different types of tchotchkes and trinkets. And she's boasting about simplicity. And yet... As Zipporah said, it takes a person who really knows themselves to be that discerning, to surround themselves with things that they really love, so much so that there could be a thousand things in one room and they all sing at the same pitch. They all harmonize together. And so a practical way that you can apply this principle into your life is to start with a really small, simple part of your wardrobe collection. So for me, that would be like my sock drawer or my underwear drawer or my jewelry drawer or my makeup collection, something small and manageable. And to go through and to simplify and streamline what is it in here that I really love And what is it in here that I really use? And just even the thought of that might feel overwhelming. And so something that I do that makes it feel a lot more manageable is I'll choose this one small area and I'll have the obvious things that I keep, the obvious things that I'm going to send on to a new life through giving them away or throwing them away. And there's this in-between category That just makes my whole body shut down and abandon the project altogether. (laughs) And I'm sure you can relate to that experience. So what I do is I keep like a time capsule box where I just take the things that I know I'm not using and that I don't feel this surging sense of love for, but I also know is causing clutter in my drawer And I'll put them in this time capsule box and I'll say three months. In three months, I'm going to revisit or 30 days or whatever the time period is for you. What usually happens is that I completely forget that the box is there and then I find it like two years later. And they're either new and fun to me again or it's very clear what I can live without. And so if streamlining and simplifying what it is that you really love causes you to fuzz out a little bit, try that time capsule approach and try streamlining this one small area as an example of ways that you could apply that to a bigger project like your closet or like your desk, etc. Number two is a generous and unapologetic love of beauty. So in the movie, The Gospel According to Andre, which is a documentary about iconic fashion editor Andre Leontelli, there's a scene where Andre is talking about his grandmother who raised him and the beauty and glamour that she would exhibit when she went to church on Sundays. And there was a quote from Ebony Marshall Williams that I loved so much I had to write it down on the spot, which says, Sunday was when you brought your absolute best to God. Oh, just have to say it again. Sunday was when you brought your absolute best to God. And I just love that so much because I would be remiss not to 
acknowledge the rampant consumerism that happens in the fashion and especially the fast fashion or throwaway fashion world. And the way that that can create a generalization around beauty and style and fashion is frivolous and bad and wrong. And what I would like to invite you to is a relationship to beauty and style that is a sign of dignity and an esteemable act. And here's where we get to nerd out on your nervous system. (laughs) So if you're a regular listener to the podcast, you know that when it comes to sensual embodied living, we can always trace the breadcrumb path to something happening in your nervous system. And so your primal brain, you know, your subconscious, the part of you that is most concerned with your survival, When we are in a state of sustained and chronic fight, flight, freeze, that adrenal response, that fear response, there's not a lot of room for passions and hobbies in that space. You know, your body is really oriented towards stay alive, stay safe, stay alive, stay safe. And when we are able to stimulate that parasympathetic response, sometimes called the rest and digest response, if you've ever had the experience of going on a vacation and about two or three days in, all of a sudden you just have all these brilliant creative ideas. And it's because when your parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated, that survival impulse can just chill And there's room for things like passions and creativity and hobbies. And similarly, a way to coax and initiate that parasympathetic response is by creating an environment that signals safety. And I know for myself that when I'm going through my morning ritual of dressing and quaffing and I have the space within myself to maybe put a cut flower in a bud vase on my desk, it sends a signal to my nervous system, oh, well, if there's room for us to pay attention to beauty, then maybe this primal adrenaline-soaked stress response can relax a little bit. And sight is one of our most powerful senses for assessing our safety. And so when we take an act of deliberate beauty, it is a way of affirming not only our survival, but our desire to thrive and participate in our life. And in the School of Sensual Living purpose statement, which you can find if you go to schoolofsensualliving.com slash purpose, and you can download it and print it out. The final quote is my favorite quote, which is the more present you can be in your body, the more fully you can show up in your life. And your life is worth showing up for. And so... A question I would pose to you is, what if beauty could be a source of my health and my healing? What if beauty was not a way of proving myself or my status in the world? But what if it was a somatic, body-based way for me to care exquisitely for this life? And I'm going to close this point by saying that whenever I do coaching with a woman, we look at what her dreams and her goals and her visions are for her life and what the obstacles are. And then we spend a good amount of time talking about her style and her wardrobe and her relationship to beauty and her skincare regimen and her daily beauty nourishment ritual, because I believe that it is a essential nutrient for a woman's soul to thrive. Number three, these essential truths about style, is that great style always tells a story. 
And so I want to read to you a paragraph from this wonderful book called Home Sweet Maison, The French Art of Making a Home by Danielle postel Vinet. And in this paragraph, she's talking about the entrance to a French home as it differs from what you might experience when you're walking into, say, an American home. This is also the part of the podcast where I'm going to make my best attempt to pronounce a French word. Pray for me. <laughs> okay. The French entrée, entrée meaning entrance to a home, presents you with a mystery. The entrée is where one gives clues, creates puzzles, tells stories, and entices you to enter into their lives. An invitation into a French home is an invitation into a French person's inner life. It is not extended casually. It is a commitment to create an intimate and deep relationship. The homeowner's past and present meet in their living space, and it happens as soon as you step in the front door. The entrée exposes one's intimate life through deeply personal, emotionally charged objects that tell a story about who you are, where you came from, and who you want to be. And I just love that paragraph so much, and it really inspired me when I was styling my home to focus less on creating a perfect symmetry or eye rhythm or mimicking what I may have seen on Pinterest and more to bring more of myself and the meaning of my life and tell the story of me in my home. And so some ways that I would do that is I've lived in New York City for 15 years of my life and then I moved to Asheville, North Carolina. And so because I have such a deep love of New York and it's my home, I would have vintage postcards framed on the wall of New York City landmarks. I used to be a burlesque dancer. And so one time for a fundraiser, I purchased a pair of dirty martinis nipple tassels, <laughs> used nipple tassels that she was auctioning off. She's an incredible burlesque performer. And they were framed in a shadow box on my wall. And so, you know, it's this mysterious piece, this nod to my past to see a random pair of nipple tassels on my wall. And yet it invites this intimate conversation about who I am and who I've been. I love to inspire my future self as well with my home. And so I have a framed picture of Colette, who is a famous author who literary career didn't really take off until she was well into her 40s and it's a deep desire for me to become a published author. I have a deep desire for international travel so in my bedroom there are these beautiful Moroccan style lanterns to bring a worldly expression into my home and so these are all examples of ways that you can use beauty and style to not just look good and pretty and pleasing, but to layer in meaning into your life and into your home and into your wardrobe. Number four is that there is inspiration for your style everywhere. So for those of you who feel like you don't have time or it's too complicated, I want you to just look around the room that you're in right now and find one thing that you find even mildly beautiful. And imagine how might I create an outfit using this thing as my point of inspiration. So I'll give you an example. Right now I'm staring at a big, fat, bulbous hydrangea, a magenta hydrangea, and I see this juicy, bright magenta. I see the deep, rich, smooth leaves. I see the bright green stem. And so why not put on a magenta dress with a bright green bulbous necklace? I could create an outfit of all one color, like a monochromatic, like just a white pants, white top, or white dress and place a hydrangea in my hair. I could wear a pair of cigarette pants that 
come up a little bit above the ankle with socks that are magenta or the color of like a creamy lilac, like those lilac hydrangeas that you see in the Northeast and a pair of patent leather loafers. And so I'm taking this one piece and I'm just allowing my imagination to create a lookbook in my mind. And I share that with you because again, if you feel like you don't have time to research style or to experiment with style, I really encourage you to just look around you and allow these visuals of what you already love to be the origin point for your inspiration. And the fifth and final essential truth around style is that all great style is the result of lots and lots and lots of mistakes. <laughs> so I used to work in an office with a dear friend and she was very passionate about style. And sometimes she would come in and I would just be like, what is she wearing? You know, it just would clash or it just didn't, just didn't harmonize. And then every once in a while, she would hit it so on the mark and she would just look like someone who had just stepped off the pages of Harper's Bazaar onto the streets of New York City. And what I so respected about her is that she was willing to be in process with her style and try things that didn't work in service to understanding what did work for her. And so a practical way that you can apply that into your life and something that I do that's really fun is when I'm shopping or browsing a store, I will try on at least one thing that I think, oh God, I would never wear that. Or, oh God, I, that would look terrible on me. And I give myself the opportunity to just try it. It's like caviar. You know, oh, I would hate caviar. Oh, I can't imagine. Well, try it. Have you ever tried it? I mean, I've actually never tried caviar, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Um, and those experiences are so affirming because they either tell me, yep, this looks terrible on me, or they tell me, wow, I never imagined that this would look like this on me. And it opens up all these new dimensions in my mind of new styles that I can try and wear. So my loves, to close out today, I want to share one of my favorite quotes with you, which is an Emerson quote, and it is, beauty is God's handwriting. And so I hope that this time together has been helpful in allowing the divine to sign its name all over your life through beauty. If you enjoyed this podcast, please let me know in a review. Again, you can go to schoolofsensualliving.com slash review for a quick tutorial on how to leave a review. And if you'd like to be more intimate with this community, head over to schoolofsensualliving.com slash purpose to download our purpose statement. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time.